Okay, I have to share again. Technology. Okay. <clears throat> well, um, so Orlando, thank you for joining us today. So right now you're with uh, several city staff members. I'm not going to introduce everybody, um, but if we get into some questions, uh, I wanted to have several subject matter experts here uh, to help answer those questions. So. Uh, this meeting is being recorded and we will post it on the um, real property website after the meeting. Um, so it will be available to others who are interested in this bid opportunity. Um, so if you've got a question, Orlando, since it's a small group, feel free to just unmute yourself and ask uh, during the meeting. And um, if it's going to come up later in the slides, I'll just let you know that. So, okay. okay. Thank you. Let's see. Figure out. Okay, so I think I have just around 20 slides today. It'll probably go pretty quick. Um, a lot of them are probably high level information, but we'll just kind of go through the property location, the flood risk at the site, some highlights of the notice of sale, uh, what the evaluation process is going to be, and then the timelines. So, um, in terms of location, this is in the Arlington Heights area of Fort Worth. Um, send, uh, Orlando, are you are you from the Fort Worth area? Do you want me to go into detail? Or are you already familiar with the Arlington Heights area? Yes, I'm familiar with. I live here in Arlington City. Okay. Yeah, I'm familiar. Okay. Right. okay, sounds good. Then I'll kind of keep it high level. Um, yes. So Arlington Heights area of Fort Worth. Um, so zooming in into that area. Um, the, the neighborhood where these uh, properties are available and for sale um, is just around three miles west of downtown. So great location close to downtown, just west of the cultural and medical district. So um, it's a great location in terms of accessibility and commutes uh, close to the Botanic Gardens and the zoo. Uh, so this information I pulled actually from the appraisal report, which is on the um, City's website with the notice of sale information just talks a little bit about the the neighborhood. It's very uh, stable. Um, it's over 75% built up, and there's a lot of residential demand in the area. Um, I thought the conclusion was pretty good in there. It, it talked about given foreseeable increases in population growth for the area and the stable demand for residential uses, values are expected to increase in the foreseeable future. Um, so there is a lot of demand. Uh, this is a great part of town uh, to live and work in. So going on to the flood risk, uh, I pulled this from the appraisal as well. It just shows um, kind of where the flood risk is happening in the area. So the, the nine properties are kind of in this green area and I'll zoom in on the next slide. Um, we've had Freese and Nichols do engineering evaluations to better understand the flood risk, and that's what's shown here is their more detailed engineering mapping. And this is due to a storm drain system that runs through this part of town um, that is undersized. And so when the storm drain system fills up with water, then it goes across the surface. Um, and so this is um, unfortunately a common problem in, in some older, many older parts of Fort Worth that were just built um, a long time ago. Uh, they've got smaller storm drain systems with less capacity, and so there's flooding in the area. So zooming into where that um, circle was, uh, these are the nine properties that are in the notice of sale package. So we've got four properties, and these are the ones in the blue outline on Western and five on Carlton Avenue. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the green hatching ones in a few minutes so you understand um, what that is. So in terms of the flood risk out there, um, they're pr prone again to flooding during kind of intense rain events because of the undersized storm drain system. They're not in a specifically, when you look at the female floodplain maps, they don't show up um, as having female floodplain on them. Um, they're identified as uh, zone X shaded and unshaded in this area. Uh, so uh, at the city, we have started calling areas like this across the town, uh, non FEMA flood risk areas, specifically city flood risk areas. If we have evaluated them in more detail, uh, because we want people to understand if they live and work in these areas that there is flood risk that happens out there. But we also want to be really clear that this is 
different than the uh, the FEMA floodplain risk, uh, which is a, a more um, federal regulatory um, risk area. So the city is in the process of um, regulating these areas and we hope to do so sometime in the future, um, but we're not there yet. So these are just some pictures that show what the flood risk um, has looked like and has done in the past. Um, I do have a little video clip that I wanted to play just um, so, so everyone understands kind of what the flood risk is like um, and there's no surprises. So let me click on this and let's see. So we might have to watch a little advertisement for a second. Okay, so here's part of, so these are, um, these are some of the properties right over here that you see. So you can kind of see how the water flows through this area, um, collects in the street. And then I've got another video that I will play in a second too. So this one is on Carlton Avenue. And then I've got another one of Western Avenue, just so you can see how the water flows through there uh, with, with a good amount of velocity. Um, and then let me open up this other video. So this one is, is Western. Uh, so this, these are both from um, a rain event in June 2016. So I will say it's a little bit kind of jerky, uh, whoever shot this video, but you can see how deep the water can get in the street uh, at this location. So there can be significant uh, car flooding. Um, this is uh, house flooding. So these are uh, the houses in this area. And that's why, and so this really helps explain why we're having the elevation requirements for the redevelopment in this area is because we wanna make sure that while the properties uh, will continue to flood, um, uh, sorry, let me reshare, uh, that the homes themselves don't. Let me reshare that. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, so moving on. So the two properties, uh, let me go back to this map that are shown in green. Since they are kind of like between the ones that are for sale as a part of the notice of sale, I wanted to explain a little bit about those just so um, everyone would understand what they are. So again, they're not included in the notice of sale. These properties were acquired with FEMA grant funding. And so that means the city is required to hold on to them. We can't sell them to um, a private property owner. Um, and so they're required to remain green space in perpetuity um, in terms of to allow the water to infiltrate down into these properties. So the city has removed the homes that used to be on these properties. So now they are uh, basically grass lots with some remaining trees. We do have sprinklers out there and that we uh, regularly mow and maintain these properties. Uh, we wanna keep them nice looking. It's in a nice established neighborhood. And so um, the properties that you will be building on adjacent to these, uh, just so you kind of understand what that area is. Um, based off of feedback from the community, we talked about, you know, could these become pocket parks or so forth? Um, the community did not really want to use them as park spaces. Um, and so right now they're, they're unprogrammed properties. Uh, we wanted to leave clear sight lines in and out um, so there wouldn't be any uh, loitering or anything like that. But there is a potential that in the future, um, the future uh, adjacent property owners could potentially use these for uh, part of their yards and help maintain them through an agreement with the city. So we are open to uh, possibly allowing the adjacent property owners to utilize these sites and help maintain them um, as long as they comply with all of the grant restrictions. So I just wanted to um, talk a little bit about those properties. So moving into the notice of sale, um, the big part is that somebody has to buy again all of these nine properties. Um, the development must be complete within 48 months from uh, closing. And if the developer fails to meet the conditions uh, that are outlined in the notice of sale, the city does have the option to buy the properties back for $10. I will say we don't want to do that. We want to work with any interested developer um, and try to help make their development a success. Um, 
So the developer does have a 90 day opportunity to cure failure that's included in the deed as well. Um, and, and again, we, we want to help make this development a success. So we really don't want to buy the properties back. I will say that. Um, so the big thing again is uh, these homes could be either the existing homes can remain and be elevated or they could be torn down and new homes can be built. Um, everything has to be built at least two feet above the 100 year non FEMA flood risk um, and comply with our stormwater development regulations. So this is the home and this is um, equipment that's servicing the home. So like air conditioners as well would have to be elevated um, at least two feet above the 100 year flood elevation. Uh, we will require um, elevation certificates as well for these properties. Um, and that will be good too, as well as for the future property owners, they'll be able to provide those to their insurance company um, in terms of to help show that they're built above flood risk, which of course impacts uh, flood insurance premiums and so forth. Uh, so what these um, couple pictures, these are two of the homes right here that are included in the notice. This red line shows kind of approximately where the two feet above the flood elevation uh, would be. So you can kind of see these homes will be raised around three to four and a half feet higher than where their current finished floor is today. Um, also included in the deed is we want to make sure that the future ultimate purchasers or renters of these properties are aware of the flood risk. Um, as I said earlier, the properties are flood prone and they would continue to flood. So if somebody is parked there, uh, their vehicle could get flooded, their yards will flood, so forth. So we just want to make sure that they understand that that flood risk is there, even if their, their home is built above flood risk. Um, and then lastly, uh, the developer has to demonstrate how downstream and adjacent properties will be protected during the redevelopment process. So kind of uh, going into that in a little bit more detail is that we'll want them to uh, demonstrate through plan submittals. So this will all go through the development services department. We have a specific stormwater team that would be reviewing this development to make sure that it complies with our standards. Uh, we wanna make sure that we aren't aggravating the existing flood risk with the new development and that both the ultimate development plans as well as the interim development plans are gonna be reviewed and looked at uh, by the city. Uh, a big impact um, in terms of the flooding uh, or, or how, how the flooding and the flow happens are the, the fences that are out there right now and the fences do have an impact on water flows. And so one of the points will be to uh, maintain the existing fencing that's out there or if that fencing needs to be replaced or shifted a little bit one way or the other on property lines, that's fine, but we want to make sure that it's uh, maintained or that same type of fencing is put back up in place um, in terms of to just keeping the, the current drainage patterns in place. Um, other things to consider is just maintaining those current flow paths around the house, uh, making, making sure that we're not uh, increasing impervious cover or offsetting um, if we're adding impervious cover somewhere. Um, there can't be significant changes to grading that could impact somebody else. And we do have a lot of engineering uh, reports and modeling done for this area. So we could provide that upon request. So somebody has a starting point and they're not starting from scratch uh, with information available for these sites. Um, so just kind of a little bit of background about how we came up with the requirements. Uh, the community is very engaged and active in this area. And so we uh, worked with them as we pulled this together. We wanted to hear the input from the community members. And so um, that is built into the notice of sale. Um, the developer's plans will be reviewed for compliance with guidelines before building permits are issued. And so kind of some of the highlights from the notice of sale is that these are all single family homes. Um, the lots can't be replatted. There is an exception. There's an existing duplex on Western um, that's elevated. If it's if it remains in place and it's not torn down and rebuilt, um, that could just be elevated in place and remain a duplex. Um, we need to observe existing front year, rear and yard uh, and side yard building setbacks as much as possible. Uh, and a lot of that has to do with uh, maintaining the flow of stormwater around the properties. Um, trying to make sure that the homes are constructed consistent with those of adjacent structures. So 
Um, a big thing was just those big McMansions. They wanted the look and feel of these homes to really be um, consistent with the rest up and down the street. Um, trying to have um, the the facades of the homes just in harmony with the whole general character of the neighborhood, and then the garages located back at the rear of the lots. <laughs> A few more highlights um, is that um, most of these properties, with the exception of 2205 Western, are historic structures or older structures, and so if they are demolished or depending on how they are elevated, uh, the developer would need to allow the city access to record those properties before they're demolished um, or elevated. So that's not in terms of a developer cost. They're not having to do that. It's something that the city just needs access um, a, a few days for us to go out there and record them, take our photographs and so forth of the homes. Um, also, as I said, there's an existing storm drain system, which is shown in red on this map uh, that run between these properties. And so uh, we would need to have an easement over the, the current alignment or there's the opportunity for the developer to relocate uh, the storm drain infrastructure within these lots and then grant us an easement over the relocated um, portion of the infrastructure. All of that has to be done in coordination and compliance with city standards and through um, the city's infrastructure plan review uh, center if that is actually relocated. Um, also, uh, we don't like to put new structures on storm drains. Of course, we want to be able to easily maintain the storm drain systems. Um, and so there could be some potential encroachment agreements just because of the location of the existing storm drain system if the current homes are left in place and elevated. So uh, we're definitely willing to uh, work with the developer to try to both accomplish uh, the development uh, and help it be successful while also protecting um, the storm drain system that runs through this area. And the city has um, the plans for the pipe system as well as condition assessment information that could be provided uh, upon request. In terms of future sales, so, um, there is a, of course, the, the future um, successful bidder can resell the properties. Um, if that happens, the notice of sale conditions will run with the land and be binding on future owners. So that's the big key. Um, the city will release the conditions upon successful redevelopment of the properties with two exceptions. Uh, one being is that in the future, because of the flood risk out there, uh, we always wanna make sure that the homes are built at least two feet above that non-FEMA flood elevation and that the future owners or renters are provided notice of the risk that's out there. In terms of the selection process, uh, this is a best value section, uh, selection. So we're looking at more than just the bid amount. Um, and so there will be the, the 70 points for the highest bid with a sliding scale from there. There's no minimum bid that, uh, that is set. And then um, the bidders can get up to 20 points for elevating existing homes versus new builds. And this was put in there because the neighborhood uh, would rather see the existing homes elevated versus um, the homes uh, demolished and rebuilt. So there could be up to four points for these four high priority homes. These are ones that have uh, more historical value identified uh, by the neighborhood in coordination with the uh, city historic preservation officer. So uh, more points if these homes are kept and elevated versus demolished and rebuilt. Uh, one point for the other four homes, and again, no point for 2205 Western because that's a recent rebuild. And then lastly, um, there can be up to 10 points received for the degree of compliance with the neighborhood community development checklist. Um, so this is going to be uh, determined by a group of community stakeholders. Most of them would be property owners that live on Western and Carlton on these two impacted blocks as well as probably a few from the neighborhood association itself that would be reviewing this part of the bid package. Um, they, of course, would like to see the trees that are there saved as much as possible, as well as could there be flood mitigation techniques built into the development like bioswales or permeable pavement, uh, rain barrels, um, also salvage plans versus just if there's demolition, um, having all of that go to a landfill, could there be a way to salvage some of the 
um, historic um, parts of the homes instead of sending it to a landfill. Um, and then two, um, if there's actually elevation that's done in compliance with Secretary of the Interior Standards. So the group would assign a score uh, from excellent to poor with or exceptional, with exceptional being like a 10 or poor would be a, a zero or a one. Um, so that's how those points would be assigned for a total of a hundred point system. In terms of future community involvement, the successful bidder would need to hold a community meeting with area residents to discuss the development plans. Um, that doesn't have to, have to happen really soon or anything like that, but as it gets closer and those get figured out, um, we just want to make sure that the community is aware uh, before that impact happens and understands uh, what is going to happen. There's also the opportunity to potentially acquire adjacent properties for redevelopment opportunities or to sell items in those homes um, instead of it was a part of a salvage plan to area residents. So I've had a, a few residents um, that have said, hey, you know, maybe would the developer buy my property or could they maybe sell me something on these properties? Uh, so I just wanted to throw that out there that there is some interest out there. Um, and so whoever purchases these properties, you know, might want to get with the neighborhood to see if there's other opportunities uh, for redevelopment that could be pursued in conjunction with this. For addendum, uh, we are working to post the agenda on our website soon. Uh, in terms of changes, uh, we had planned to not read the bids like we normally do, but we are going to change that and the bids will be open when they're um, submitted by the deadline of November 30th. And so they'll be open and read out, um, out loud and then be provided for evaluation by the city team. Also, the Star Telegram ad notes that 2212 Carlton has FEMA floodplain, but it does not. Um, and then we've had a couple questions uh, received. So one is, are the properties livable? And so they're not livable until the conditions are met, such as the elevation of the structures. Um, and then can new homes be built over the platted lines, reducing density and providing for larger housing with more yard space? Um, so here, kind of the big part is, Andrea, I'll get with you in a second, um, is that the community really wants to see homes that are similar to the state, the scale of the established homes. And so the big part of that is the, the larger housing product um, is not acceptable. Andrea, what have you got? Can you unmute yourself? Oh, I was just going to tell you the addendum is already posted. Perfect. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. It's great. Um, okay. So I think this is the last slide is a timeline and all of this information is the very same that's in the notice of sale. Um, but so, of course, today we're at the pre proposal meeting. So, next week, we've got our due diligence site uh, visit. And so we've got 2 half days next week um, on the 20th and 21st 1st day in the morning and 2nd day in the afternoon. So, we wanted to allow any interested bidders to be able to come out and actually walk through the homes and see um, what it would take to possibly elevate them or. Um, demo and rebuild. Uh, so we wanted to make sure that they had an opportunity to walk the homes. Um, everyone who walks the homes will have to fill out just a brief two page waiver um, just to make sure, um, you know, in case there's some you trip on something. Um, so that's just part of the city process. And then uh, the deadline to submit any future questions is October 20th by noon. Um, and then we will turn those around by at least within a week uh, with follow up by adding that to the website and letting everybody know that they're out there. Um, questions provided before then uh, will be followed up more quickly, just like how we just added um, some agenda today to the website. So we're kind of trying to add those every week or two, depending on how many are received, because we want to make sure that people are getting their questions answered so they can move forward and help make uh, decisions regarding um, bidding on these properties. And then, of course, the big date is November 30th uh, by 1.30 p.m. is when these bids are due uh, to the purchasing department at City Hall. And then we anticipate uh, awarding this preliminary in January. Um, so, since it's going to be the December holiday timeframe, we'll probably be meeting with the community stakeholder group during December 
the city will be reviewing uh, the bid packages based off that evaluation criteria and then selecting someone in January to move forward with the sale. So with that, um, are there any questions? Jennifer, I just wanted to see if you could clarify one thing on kind of the next to the last slide when you're talking about the criteria for the size of the property. Um, I just want to make sure is it uh, my understanding is that we aren't going to increase the footprint, but if a developer wanted to go higher, that would be is that acceptable? Yeah, yes. So the developer can build higher. So, uh, yes, most of these, I think maybe all of them, honestly, I, I, no, not all of them, uh, but a lot of these are 1 story homes. And so, yes, a developer could build higher. Um, and so in terms of the footprint. Um, it's really kind of balancing that impervious cover. So potentially you could add to your impervious cover for one, um, or maybe there's impervious cover that's out there already that's under an outbuilding or something like that that could be uh, kind of swapped so the house could be expanded. So um, that's part of the working with the stormwater development services group is showing what's there today um, and, and how moving things around and reconfiguring is it going to make the flooding worse for anybody else? Are there any other questions? And I know right now I'm really talking with you, Mr. Orlando. So, <laughs> yeah, and I do uh, have a question. Um, so, is there an opportunity to, let's say, rent these properties for a year or so while? You know, get, let's say that uh, we decide to tear down some of these houses. So now we gotta get new floor plans and all that, get the engineering and so on. Go through the city. Uh, you know, all that process takes a few months. So I want to see is the opportunity there to rent uh, these properties while all of that is going on before the tear down and the new build happens, or or do they need to be stay vacant? completely until um, they are either elevated or tear down and build with a new structure. Right, right. So they're vacant right now, so they need to stay vacant. Uh, we're not gonna rent them for someone else to live in them really because of the flood risk to those homes. Um, and that's the reason, that's a good kind of segue. That is the whole reason why the city bought those properties to begin with because of the repetitive flooding that happened uh, to the homes. And that's why the new homes that go back um, have to be either elevated the existing or um, or rebuild new homes. Um, there could be uh, a developer could come in and and do a combination. If you look at the bid package, so they could decide I want to elevate you know these homes and tear down and rebuild right. some of the the other homes. So there there's definitely an option to do the combination. But no, we we won't be renting them. Okay, cool. And then. Um, um, you mentioned that there are other neighbors interested in selling the properties. Will they uh, have the opportunity to buy it directly from them or do they need to go through you, through the city? So, yeah, not through the city. So that would be something uh, that whoever purchases these in the future um, is that there have been neighbors in potentially they could change their mind by then. They could move. I don't know. Uh, but it's been brought up to me by some in the community that said, hey, you know, um, I might want to sell if, if someone who to whoever comes in here too, um, as well as I might want to purchase something. So I just wanted to throw that out there. You know, so interested developers would be aware that there might be other opportunities, but that would have to be directly between the developer and whoever is interested. Okay. Okay. And, um. I had another question. Well, uh, the other question was, um, you mentioned that we buy the properties that can also be resold, and then the new owner would need to, you know, comply with these regulations. The question is. Um, do we need to sell them all together as well as a package as you know currently being sold or can they be sold individually and then the, those new owners will just need to comply with uh, with these regulations 
So to my understanding, um, they could be sold individually. I will say the city would rather work with one developer on all of these properties, but I don't think that we can require um, that they can't be sold individually. Okay. And then uh, they would just have to comply with the same rules, right? Four years. Okay. Um, Correct. Yeah, they would have to all go through um, the city's development review process um, to make sure that there wasn't any adverse impacts um, and to make sure everything is elevated and built in compliance with the standards and guidelines. Okay. Um, how long has the city owned these properties? Oh, Niels, can you help me with like maybe through two, two years? <clears throat> I believe two it's years? been two years. Two to, I think around two years. Two years, okay. Not, yeah, not, not too long, but long enough. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, yeah, those are all the questions I can think of right now. Okay. Well, if you've got other questions, uh, definitely submit them to uh, the cah.sale at fortworthtexas.gov email address. Mm -hmm. um, and hopefully you come out next week to the site visit and take a look at all the properties. Awesome. Well, Great. thank you for the call. It was uh, very informative. Good. Great. Well, thank you so much for participating and thank you city team um, for your involvement as well. I appreciate it. Y'all have a good afternoon. Thank you, you too. Thank you. Bye. Bye.